Greetings. This is the 15th message looking at the life and ministry of the famous Welsh Calvinistic Methodist exhorter, Mr. Hal Harris. And what a wonderful Christian brother he is indeed. I hope you're finding at least some of these messages a great encouragement and blessing. I'm certainly being blessed by simply uh, studying this man's life. What an encouragement. Much to learn from him. Well, this week what we're going to look at what I'm calling the tidal wave and also Christian unity. Now, there are biblical truths, things that I want to emphasize that certainly were part of the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist ministry that I want to remind you of just some simple biblical truths, undisputed biblical truths. First, from Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 8, and the first reminder is Christianity is emotional. It's not emotionalism meaning that you have some kind of passion or emotion without truth, as if it's just, you know, misguided. No, no, no. But Christianity is emotion. So, for example, in verse 8, it says here, But when Simon Peter saw it, referring to the fish, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Well, what has happened here? I mean, they surprisingly caught a bunch of fish. Why is Simon Peter acting this way? Because he's coming to realize he's in the presence of a divine king, the Messiah. That's what's happening. When you experience God to that level, and you see this in times of revival, by the way, where there's such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, even the non-believing world recognizes something is different. And you have this great emotion that comes over you that says, depart from me, for I am a sinful creature. A being so holy, so divine, so righteous, so powerful, so glorious. What else can one say? I've shared before during times of revival in Boston, if a minister has said that if the streets were paved with gold, bricks, not a single person would steal one. Because there was such a presence of holiness And it was the presence of a person, God himself. And that needs to be understood, needs to be remembered. Yes, Christianity is emotional. And it produces an outcome where the condition of our hearts change. I think it's in John's Gospel, chapter 13. Here it is, yes. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Our affections have changed. Our priorities have changed. We used to see things, you know, the natural man cannot understand the ways of the Lord. But now we've been born again, so now we can. God's priorities, the way that he sees things, we take quite seriously when we read in John's epistles that indeed God is love. And what is love? That we have the ability to lay down our lives for one another. Yes, indeed. And we have compassion for this lost, broken world, don't we? The Bible tells us, I, I just there's this wonderful uh, uh, billboards all around South Carolina, and one of them says, genuine Christians love their enemies. I, amen, I agree. We look at this world, and the Bible uh, tells us we are to love our enemies. We don't, we don't hate anybody. That's not permitted. Mm -mm. But we also don't affirm this lost, broken world. Why? Because we want people to flourish. And the way people flourish is by coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. New life, new heart. They serve a trusted king. One who's not going to play with their emotions and lead them into destruction. Like the prince of this world, Satan himself. I'm not... I'm not, I'm not um, hesitant at all about saying his name and the effects that Lucifer is having on this world. It is tremendous. It is plain. You just have to believe your lying eyes because you see it every single day. 
Yes, so we have a love for one another. And, and Apostle Paul expands it further if you want to. You, you can go to um, 2 Corinthians, and if you look at, what is it, chapter 5, and begin with verse 11, yes, there it is. The, the, set, the subtitle is The Ministry of Reconciliation. And what it shows is our relationship to God has changed, our relationship to one another has changed, our relationship to sin has changed, our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ has changed. And I might also add our relationship to this world has changed, the relationship to Satan has changed, because you're no longer under his, his rule, you know, the, the rule of Lucifer. No, you, you're, you're a rebel against, against Satan now. You're a traitor, if you will because you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these things have changed. That's what, that's what happens when you're, when you're born again. And I want you to see that. I want us to remember it. The other divine truth is, you know, I, I said to you, and you may want to read all of 2 Corinthians with the with the with the with the view that this is Paul's most personal letter. And here's Paul describing his, not only his ministry, but what I would say is his, his life, his life. And this really follows well, or I should say, Hal Harris's ministry follows well, the pattern, if you will, of Apostle Paul's ministry. And he begins, I'm going to begin here, verse or chapter 11, beginning around verse 23. He says here, I, I'm a madman. I'm a, let me talk like a madman for a minute. I, I've had, you know, far more imprisonments with countless beatings, by the way, often near death. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And night and day I was at, adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers. Now, let me stop here, by the way. Um, it's quite not surprising that young Mark would turn and go home, huh, when he's out with Apostle Paul. I mean, let's just be a little bit humbled by that, okay? <laughs> this is Paul describing his ministry. L look at what's happening here. Look at all these dangers. Look at all these trials. Dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers, in toil and hardship, though many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Yeah. And most importantly, Apostle Paul, in a very honest, open way, says, and pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. What do you call that? Well, he's brutally honest, isn't he? And these are the challenges, and thus you see Hal Harris's ministry following suit, because Hal Harris's relationship has changed just like ours. So, of course, there's going to be opposition. Now, I say to you, the devil has no principle, so he's going to try to get at us any way that he possibly can. And so you might say, well, John, I'm not shipwrecked. I don't have to sleep in, at night. You know, I don't have to, you know, I'm, I, I haven't been at sea lost, you know, in the water overnight. I, I don't have those experiences. No, but if you look at the... Um, if you look at your screen, and I, I admit it's a very poor illustration in terms of uh, the quality of illustration, but um, but I think it serves its purpose well, and I was glad I was able to find this. What what you see on the screen, what's supposed to be, is a is a Christian soldier having the armor of God on, and. This Christian is taking a stand. He, he can't run. That would be cowardly. You can't run into the tidal wave because that would be absolute arrogance. All the Christian can do is take his stand. And though it looks like with this tremendous tidal wave coming upon the Christian that he's going to be crushed, he totally trusts in the Lord because the Lord has told him, 
that he's going to be with him. That he's going to love him and care for him. And support him through these trials and tribulations. That in our weakness, our Lord will be exalted. That we will rest on him. We will, we will have the attitude of Job. Though he slay me, I trust in the Lord. So, the Christian sees the tidal wave. He sees the truth. And that tidal wave consists of many things to try to eradicate our faith. And that's what you, those, that's what, what you might be able to see, if, as long as you're not driving. But that's what you'll see on the screen. And I'm going to read them quickly to you. These are the things that, that overcome us on a daily basis, maybe hourly, maybe minute by minute. But these are the things, the way the devil tries to get at us. And let me read them to you. Serve false gods. Get you to believe that Christ lied. A belief in evolution. Discontentment. A love of self will draw us away from Christ. Don't experience God. God is not real. Persecution. Wear us down. Fear and threats, no hope, busyness, love of money, despair, self-righteousness, just a helplessness where we want to give up, just general lies, greed, lust, drink and drugs in order to escape. Anger and jealousy, yes, the mind will play many tricks on us if we're not careful. Malice and strife, loneliness, hate, laziness, immorality. Sickness and disease can wear us down. Doubt and confusion don't take faith seriously. Politics and economics. Yes, entertainment. Bitterness, death and destruction, rivalries, division, false assurance, tradition. Oh, despise preaching, despise Scripture, despise preachers, despise holiness, despise worship. Witchcraft, judge harshly, don't judge. Love gossip, mockery, no law, no deception, self-deception. Despise thinking, revival's not real. No resurrection, no new creation, no heaven, no hell, no sin. Faith in faith can certainly lead many astray and away from the Lord. False doctrine, trust works and heart, self-justifying religion, despise praying, despise reading. And actually, I think the list is, I had to crop this photo so there's actually more. I would have you think about that. There you are, there you are as a Christian. Here is the tidal wave. Here are all the things that try to take you away from Jesus Christ. What would you add to the list? Think about it. So my point is, yeah, I, I get it. We live at different times. But Satan has no principles. So my point is, <laughs> Satan's got to get Apostle Paul and just forgive me for being so blunt, but he needs Apostle Paul to shut up. Ideally, Apostle Paul would die. Let's, let's get rid of this guy. These darn Christian apostles keep going around teaching and planting churches. And now we got letters, you know, just looking at it from Satan's viewpoint. Now we got these darn epistles going around from church to church that are being read. More divine truth. Because I, I, I think C.S. Lewis is quite right, you know, that, that Satan would look at God as his enemy, sure. Right? And so Satan's saying, hey, my enemy has invaded this earth because the Messiah is here. And he rose again after, after three days, and that really surprised me. So now I've got to, I've got to you know, I, I killed Stephen. You think that would be enough? 
I want this world to, to forget all that Jesus said, forget him. And now I've got all these darn churches being planted. So what am I going to do? I'm going to bring as many threats and many dangers against Apostle Paul to keep him quiet. Now, what was happening to Hal Harris? What was Hal Harris's great crime? He's just traveling around Wells. And the established church is saying, Mr. Harris, you're not allowed to do that. We're not going to ordain you as a minister. We're not going to validate what you're doing because you're, you're, you're not following the rules. And all Hal Harris is doing is going around preaching the gospel and people are lying about him, just like Apostle Paul. They're, they're throwing all sorts of things at him, including dead animals. You know, they're, they're bringing their horns and musical instruments to drown him out. The, the, one minister, when he, when uh, he visits one town, you've heard the story before, where he says, hey, where, where is there a good church I could attend? And did one that preaches the gospel, you know, and he goes to this church and the minister is up there railing against him, warning his congregation that Hal Harris is coming. And oh, by the way, he wants to talk about um, circular schools so people can be educated enough in order to read their Bibles. So let's get this right. We're going to persecute Hal Harris for what? for traveling, for preaching the gospel, and wanting to educate people so they can read their Bibles. Really? And we're going to throw dead dog parts on him? Oh, we're going to try to put, you know, dynamite under, I think this was with Daniel Rowland, but we're going to try to put dynamite? Oh, we're going to have a bunch of men come with guns threatening to shoot Hal Harris? Oh, we're going to push him down the stairs? Right? You remember the long list of things? Oh, let's get the fire truck, you know, the large bucket on wheels with a pump, and let's hose him down, you know. Let's do everything we can to convince him to be quiet. And what I'm pointing out here, you as the Christian, you as this figure, man, woman, child, with the armor of God, totally trusting in the Lord, what I'm suggesting to you, if we look at this world spiritually, is... All of these things, or many of these things, are overwhelming us every single day, and there is no escaping it. It's like the pandemic, right? Where we lock down, nations lock down, and then after a couple of weeks, after a month, you went out of your house and started traveling around, and, and, the, and the virus was still there. So what must you do? Well, you've got to build up your immune system right? And then likewise, Apostle Paul says we must strengthen the inner man, the inner woman, our souls, our faith. Why? Because these things are not going away. Unbelief. That's what this world promotes. People, children growing up within the church and then leaving the church, you know, and, and maybe never to be seen from again. Well, you know, and we act surprised, but we, we can't be surprised because, again, look at the tidal wave that is overcoming us. Maybe every hour, maybe every 15 minutes, continuously through television and just going out living our normal lives. Yes. So these are the things that Apostle Paul had to fight against, though it was in different ways. And by the way, there are many Christians living today that are going through the same exact experience as Apostle Paul. So I'm not excluding that either. Hal Harris went through these uh, challenges. And we go through the same challenges, though they metastasize and take different forms. But it's all for the same goal, which is keep these Christians quiet. That's the lesson to learn. This world wants to shut us up, to put it as bluntly as I can. And I think I, think I need to. I'm not trying to be, not trying to be rude or, or, or uh, vulgar with my language, but be quiet. And this is our message to the world, okay, to put it in the positive. We have a gospel that is worth sharing. We, that is the prescription for this lost, broken world. Now, to put it in the negative, what we can also tell this world is your ways are not going to work, and they have never worked. Look at the pattern. Look at the trend. It Sin constantly leads you into destruction. Being under Satan's reign 
you never flourish. It always leads to death and destruction. All right? And just tell this world that no, we don't hate you. We have compassion for you. We were once like you. We understand. We remember what we were like when we were dead in our sins. We have compassion. So we do not hate. But we will not affirm either. We're not going to agree with what you're doing. Because it's never going to work. We would be lying to you. All right, and I'm not going to go on the litany of things that people are doing today. It's just, it's, 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 I shouldn't say it's unbelievable. Does the scriptures show us what happens? What is right will become wrong, and what is wrong will become right. What are we going to do? This world teaches us to embrace sin. So we practice it, get better at it. Great nuisance. And then boast about the fact that we created nuisance. The Bible tells us this is what man does without God. It always leads to death and destruction. So we have a positive message to share. That we can receive salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we should repent of our sins and believe in Him. And by the way, that belief is is not a perfect belief. What I'm trying to say is, like there are some people who will say, well, you know, until I get all my answers questioned, you know, all my questions answered, I'm not going to believe. Well, I got a message for you. Then you're never going to believe. Faith is not without is not without doubt. There are many things to learn, to grow from. But I think it's not the fact that there's, I think the scriptures provide all the answers to our questions. The, the real challenge is there's, it's pride, arrogance, it's self-righteousness. There's just the sin that's within us wants to be our own savior. We want to save ourselves. And that's what I'm suggesting. What keeps people away from Christ is, is just this rebellious nature that says, I've got to go my own way. You know, there's, you know, again, I say it a million times in the scriptures. You know, what seems right to man leads to death and destruction. So, yes, we've got much to say to the world. And we should be firm and we should be winsome. And we should be plain spoken. But I want to realize these things, wherever you're at, whether you're in Wells right now or you're in America or you're in, in India, wherever you're at throughout the world, we are all experiencing the same tidal wave. To try to create unbelief, to try to distract us, to try to discourage us, to try to keep us from telling the truth. Christians are truth tellers. Again, winsomely, passionately, we're simply conveying what God has told us to convey which is to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we need to be born again. Well, Christian unity, how do we not give up? Hal Harris, though he, he was a human being, so he had his faults. He was saved, born again. His relationship Changed dramatically with God, with Christ, with sin. But guess what? It still ch had challenges. But one of the beautiful things about Hal Harris, and you kind of see this, I think he passed in 1773 to go home to glory. But like in 1769, in the following year, 1770, he would have many people come visit Tribeca. And he had wonderful relationships he was in tune with what was going on in, in America with Jonathan Edwards. I don't remember if he had direct correspondence with Jonathan Edwards, certainly through George Whitfield. But he knew what was going on. He knew what was going on in Scotland, in England, in Ireland, in Germany, in France. 
He had relationships with many ministers from all denominations, from the established church, as an example, to, to Baptist, to Presbyterian, to the Moravians. He really loved the Moravians. There was an ecumenical spirit within them because they all agreed on the very core doctrines of who God is, of, of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, on what it means to be a Christian. In other words, so there wasn't unity for unity's sake. There was unity because they were actually unified. Because the same spirit was working amongst all of them, and they rejoiced in that. Unity. Fellowship. John Wesley, when he came to Tribeca, he said, this is a neat college, he says. <laughs> I really like that. He said, this is, let me, let me quote it exactly. He says here, oh, he says, extremely neat and rather elegant, he says. And they were coming to the college for days of preaching. So many people would come to assemble. And uh, John Wesley said of, of Harris's home, a kind of little paradise, this little Christian community that Hal Harris created, this working community of brothers and sisters working together and supporting one another. And it was just a little slice of heaven in wells. So what is my point? Well, Hal Harris can teach us this is how wonderful it is to have good Christian friends, good Christian fellowship. And I think that is absolutely essential, a gift from God, so that we can endure the tidal waves that come to us likely multiple times a day, or if not multiple times an hour, and we can endure together. Even if you notice, like at least here in America, even within the same denominations, churches don't spend any time together unless they have to, like in business meetings. It's weird. I'm not going to name denominations, but it's every denomination I've never I've ever been a part of, unless there was like a special event. We're not spending any time together. Unless there's a tragedy or, you know, but we're not spending any time together. What's wrong with us? So within a particular church, the, the fellowship, the congregation may not spend good, ample quality time together. And then within the local churches, that could just be 15 miles away, not spending any time together. And then we wonder why we're struggling to live as Christians. You see what I'm saying? It, it, there are things, you know, my basic prescription, if you will. If you're Baptist, go back and listen to Charles Spurgeon. If you're Presbyterian, go back and listen to John Calvin. If you're, if you're Methodist, go back and listen to George Whitfield would be my recommendation. If you're Lutheran, go back and listen to Luther. But go back and look at and say, well, how did these Puritans and Reformers live such a powerful, beautiful Christian life. How do they do that? Well, by embracing the means of grace, which is the preaching and the reading and communion and prayer and uh, just w wonderful times of worship. But there was fellowship. There was community. Remember, Hal Harris was the great organizer within the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist movement, planting all these uh, private societies where they would come together on a weekly basis and ask each other very pointed questions. Like, hey, what have you been struggling with since the last time that we've come together? Oh, let me tell you about the tidal wave I had this week. Or let me tell you about the 22 of them I had this week. Well, I'm coming to the 30-minute mark, so I'm going to stop there. But I hope this puts it in context, right? Simple, biblical truths at the beginning understanding this tidal wave and we all have it in common and it and satan has the same goal which is to to erase the memory of jesus christ to just dishearten christians stop preaching the gospel don't be enthusiastic right because hal harris enthusiasm has become a bad Bad word, right? Because like, oh, it means you're, you're like you've lost your mind or something. No, no, enthusiasm. We need to take that word back and say, no, no. We want to be enthusiastic for the Lord. 
um, and then and then well what is one of the what is one of the cures so that we don't become disheartened that we can persevere to the end well I would tell you it's 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 fellowship it's that we're together and I'm actually going to end with this I'm going to read something to you from Jonathan Edwards and this is what he said and this has to do with enthusiast okay enthusiasm Jonathan Edwards wrote I wish I could see a history of enthusiasm through all ages written by some good hand a hearty friend of vital religion, a person of accurate judgment, a large acquaintance with church history. Such a history well written might doubtless be exceedingly useful and instructive and of great benefit to the church of God, especially if there were unit, uh, unit, uh, united with its proper account in history of true religion. I should therefore choose that the work should be a history of true, vital, and experimental religion and enthusiasm, bringing down the history from age to age, judiciously and clearly making the distinction between one and the other, observing the difference of source, progress, and issues, properly pointing out the limits and doing justice to each and every age at each remarkable period. I don't know that there is any such thing um, existence or anything that would in any good measure answer the same purpose. If there be, I should be glad to hear of it. Yeah, this reminds me that we need to take back words. We need to take back words because words are under attack, like enthusiast is under attack. We don't want to be an enthusiast. And here's Jonathan Edwards going, man, I'd love to see a history of enthusiasm throughout all the ages. Something that's true, accurate. Yeah, something that shows the true history of religion. If there is one, um, it's actually a, a, a two-set volume that I would recommend, I think, that would meet um, Jonathan Edwards' desires would be the, um, the, uh, the Calvinistic Methodist Fathers of wells and you can get the two uh, volume set from banner of truth and i think that hits what jonathan edwards is desiring so a lot of pages in those two books but i think it's worthwhile well i hope you found i'm going to stop there but i hope you found this message to be of some spiritual blessing until next time grace upon grace be with you all